thank you for having me today. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. So I thought I would start with a little story um, of how I got in the business of studying space and space exploration. So I grew up in Florida on what is now known as the Space Coast. Uh, so most of the people uh, living over there at the time, this was in the 80s, uh, late 70s, most of the people living there at the time had parents that worked for the space program. They were in some way big, avid fans of the space program. And when I was in the sixth grade in elementary school, Krista McAuliffe was ready to be the first teacher in space. So there was a widespread recruitment. She was selected. And pretty much every elementary school child growing up in the United States was doing a science fair project related to Krista McAuliffe, the teacher in space. If you were living on the Space Coast, going to an elementary school where everybody's parents work for the space program, then you went to Kennedy Space Center to watch the launch, as I did in sixth grade. And of course, that ended up being a very tragic day. The Challenger took off. Um, and those of us sixth graders standing there, you know, very excited, writing our papers on, on the teacher in space and all the experiments she was going to do, watched in total confusion. And we really didn't know what happened. So after an hour or so of standing there without any kind of word, we got back on the bus, went back to our elementary school, they put on the TV, and we all sort of sat there in shock. Um, I was very worried about this, and so my teacher said to me, um, Leslie, you should write a letter. So I wrote a letter to the president because my big fear was that the space program was going to stop, right? We had had this horrible event. Um, and you know all the media pundits were on talking about, what does this mean? Should we really not be doing these launches? They're so expensive. Um, this is really a humiliation. So I, you know, in sixth grade, wrote this letter to Ronald Reagan. Um, and to my delight, he wrote back. Um, and as a kid, I grew up having this letter from Ronald Reagan about the space program framed in my bedroom. And I felt very personally proud when a shuttle would launch um, after that moment. Of course, Reagan reaffirmed his commitment to space exploration. So fast forward 30 years later, I didn't become a rocket scientist. I became a social scientist who was fascinated by teamwork. And 30 years later, I get this phone call one day from NASA Behavioral Health and Performance. And um, one of the top research scientists in the element says to me, Leslie, I've read a bunch of your papers on teams, and I just love this work. You've done these great meta-analyses about what matters, what doesn't matter. Um, how do you build an effective team? We're focusing on the Mars mission, and one of our big red risks is teamwork. Do you want to work on this? And so that was uh, four years ago. And so now <laughs> you will learn what my answer was, uh, which was sort of like absolutely um, yes. So uh, my training is in industrial organizational psychology. I'm now in the School of Communication. But as an industrial psychologist, I think a lot about work. Um, and first, I think a lot about um, the work that it takes to go into uh, a research program like this. So I just want to thank all of the many people. A lot of them are in the room. Um, a lot of them are at NASA who have made this research possible. So um, I want to give a uh, thank you to them. Another way that I think about the future of work is work that's not going to happen. Um, well, it is going to happen with robots and AI, but it's work that's going to happen in a place that we don't normally think about, and that's outer space. Um, so we know that humans are, are on the brink of becoming not a one-planet species, but, but an interplanetary species. Um, and NASA's taken that very seriously. The Mars program, which is set to launch sometime in the 2030 with a, a uh, crewed mission, um, is underway with a goal not just of, um, like we did with the moon, going, placing a flag, and returning, but actually setting up a colony. And so uh, the long-term goal with the Mars program is to get a crewed mission there, to set up some infrastructure, and to have ongoing trips back and forth um, where humans can now engage in interplanetary space travel um, and set up scientific exploration bases on other planets. Um, so how do we get there? Um, first of all, this is everything at NASA is based on risk levels. So when you decide you want to go to Mars, you line up all the risks that have to be solved. Okay. Um, not dying of radiation, um, not getting brain cancer, <laughs> not going uh, insane um, along the way. And one of those risks is team risk. So the risk that the failure, that the mission will fail, not because of food or fuel or launch trajectories um, 
or other rocket related physical problems or health problems, but that the team, the crew that is sent won't be able to collaborate effectively, um, leading to performance decrements that ultimately cause a human related failure. So if you look at this, we're red for Mars, right? So we're okay um, on team risk for a lot of the space exploration that happens, but not for Mars. Um, so that's sort of a backdrop for this work. Now, if you want to understand why are we red for Mars, right? Why is that different um, from going to the moon or going, sending people up to the ISS for as long as a year? Um, there's a few things that are different. One is it takes 259 days to get there. So most of us have been to a research conference um, with some collaborators where maybe we had to travel together for a long time. Maybe you were on a high school athletic team and you took like a 12 hour road trip. And you were probably real excited when you got into the van for the road trip. And by the time you got out, everyone kind of smelled bad. And people were saying the same things over and over. You maybe heard some stories twice. And you thought, get me out of this van, right? So imagine that for 259 days. That gives us the first challenge, right, which is just extreme distance. Um, so if we want to understand why is Mars really so far, um, it starts with this issue of, you know, if you want to travel to Beijing, you can leave whenever you want. You can get on a plane um, and you can go. You burn some fuel to get there and you land when, you're, when you get there. That's not how we go to Mars. So because of the alignment of the planets, right, the only way to get there with current energy systems is to launch in a specific window, burn out of Earth's atmosphere into this Haman transfer orbit, and then burn into Mars's atmosphere. So that you're basically coasting a lot of the way. Um, if we look at the launch windows, it sort of brings this really into focus. So if we wanted to launch, if we said, we're ready, we're going to Mars right now, the soonest we could launch would be 2020, right? And we wouldn't get there until 2021. If we look at the 2030s, there's five launch windows. That's it. So there's five opportunities where Again, with current projections of what we can do in terms of rocket fuel and energy and payloads, that's the best case scenario for Mars. So it's very complicated. Um, and the teamwork challenge right, has to be worked out. Um, the, the team sort of can't fail because the ability to get uh, resupply missions there, to get backup crew members in place, this isn't something that you can immediately remedy. Um, so to give you more factoids about how far it is, let's think about the International Space Station. So it's 250 miles above Earth, right? Like, I don't know how far UIUC is, but um, maybe, you know, on order of magnitude of another local university. The moon, on the other hand, is 250,000 miles away. So that's a thousand times further. Um, the, so if the ISS is two steps away, the moon is walking a mile. Now think about the ISS is a mile away, the moon's like going to Europe, okay? So that gives you an, a orders of magnitude between ISS and the moon. Mars, on the other hand, is 250 miles away. That's a thousand times further. Um, so if the moon is just a step away, Mars is 3,000 miles away. So if going to the moon is like walking across your living room, going to Mars is like walking uh, to Tibet. So. The distance is very real, it, it creates a challenge uh, for collaboration, and the biggest challenge is that it means autonomy. So if you're familiar with the space program, um, the International Space Station has a mission control center. The InSight lander has a mission control center. Every mission has a, has a significant ground element of engineers and scientists who are tracking systems and can do a tremendous amount of the work that needs to go into making a successful space mission from Earth. Um, Here's Mark Watney, one of our favorite space movies. Um, and notice how he's collaborating with Earth. He's recording a video of himself uh, talking about a problem that maybe will never even be seen. So in terms of communication delays, this isn't a problem that we build a better satellite. The extreme distance means that individuals on Earth and individuals on Mars are going to be facing a 3 to 22 minute one way communication delay. That includes data transmission. So any readouts of potential problems on the ship or other systems, those data downloads aren't getting to NASA any faster um, than their audio communications are. So here's another um, quote about this problem from a former cosmonaut who was in the Mir program and the shuttle program. So all the conditions necessary for murder are met if you shut two men in a cabin measuring 18 by 20 and leave them together for two months. So now we'll go back to the 200 plus days that it takes to get there. 
uh, the 100 days or so of planned service operations, and then the 200 plus day journey we hope back. So the research question that we're looking at is what happens to teamwork under extended periods of isolation and confinement, right? Remember, there's no abort potential. Uh, your pilot goes crazy, you can't get another one. Um, and so what happens to people when you put them in these um, extreme situations? And, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could, like the biologists and the microbiologists, um, create a human Petri dish uh, where, you know, we could grow little samples of teams and then put them under different conditions and observe them days later uh, and take some measurements about what happens. So what would this human Petri dish look like? Well, we would want to manipulate the extreme isolation and confinement that people will experience. Another problem in space is that, <laughs> that we're probably familiar with, we don't get a lot of great light exposure. Most of the trip is dark. And unfortunately, humans don't respond um, and reset their circadians very well under those conditions. So one of the things that's been observed with astronauts in space for long periods is they are under extreme sleep deprivation. Um, so we need to do that. We also would like to get them to do some complex tasks and also some really boring, repetitive tasks that just have to get done. Uh, we want to monitor them 24 by 7 physiologically and also take all kinds of video. And wouldn't it be nice um, for a psychologist to give them just unlimited uh, surveys? This would sort of be uh, maybe Zimbardo's dream. Um, but actually, this is exactly what we are doing. Uh, in fact, this is uh, NASA's analog program. And so this is an, a facility in Johnson Space Center that's called HERA, the Human Exploration Research Analog. And it exists uh, back behind the Mission Control Building. And its sole functioning, NASA has a team of people who recruit teams of scientists to go into this facility and live there for extended periods of time in essentially our Petri dish. Uh, so that social scientists and other people studying nutrition and sleep patterns and brain changes can be studying these individuals. Wesley, yes. <laughs> they all failed. So some of them have failed for a variety of reasons. Um, the Hawaii one had extreme. So the Hawaii one is actually like the luxury resort of analogs <laughs> because um, you get to leave, right? So they're on the side of a volcano. And they get to do what are like simulated EV, extravehicular activity. They get to put on a spacesuit and walk outside. Um, but they also go in for longer. So that one, they had a mission of up to a year. Um, and they had significant interpersonal conflicts, right? So we know, so significant interpersonal conflicts. There was one in Russia that failed. Um, so the Russians have been doing the most extensive analog Petri dish research. Um, and they had a sexual harassment institute in incident that was across two countries, and they had to abort the mission. Um, the important point that I'll preview from Brian's question is that the reasons that are that these missions fail are all interpersonally related. Um, they don't fail just because someone says, "I'm tired, I can't perform anymore," right? Um, but they weren't necessarily measuring performance, right? So. They had the ability to abort the mission, and they did in those cases. Luis. Yeah. Uh, they are still doing. Mm, yes. Yes. So the team, that's a really good question because team risk is a performance risk, right? So they're not interested in team, a lot of the risks are for things like, um, coping styles or what they call psychosocial adaptation, right? Is the human able to function without extreme levels of depression um, that would otherwise incapacitate them? 
Team risk is performance focused, right? So the consequence is exactly what you're saying, right? Which is, can they do their job even if they don't like each other? And so that's exactly, um, I, I feel like I planted that question um, <laughs> because that's exactly what we're doing um, in contrast to what had been going on in a lot of the analogs. And I'm gonna share data with you about that specific issue of performance. Um, but first I'll take you through um, a little space history. Um, so we're not the only ones doing this. This is the Chinese um, who created the Lunar Palace. <laughs> the Lunar Palace, they're growing plants. Um, they, they actually have another one called cells. Uh, but so all over the world, uh, individuals are living in these isolation chamber petri dishes so that science can be done uh, on their teamwork. Uh, the Russians have been doing this perhaps the longest. This is the NEK facility located in Moscow. Um, the Mars 500, this is the crew. They were in there for 500 days. This was an international crew. Um, this was actually one of the more successful um, of the missions. Uh, the, Japan is in on this. So this is Japan's isolation chamber. They're doing a lot of brain research mostly uh, in their facility. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that Japan uses theirs to actually select astronauts. So in contrast, where a lot of the other analogs are designed to extrapolate out uh, to future long distance scenarios. Um, they can also be used in, as what personnel psychologists would call assessment centers. Um, the Europeans do this in style. So why, <laughs> why put a tent inside a hangar and watch people? Why not just send people to some of these exotic locations? We've got caves in Sardinia. We've got a beautiful um, South Pole Station Concordia base which always has a French or an Italian cook um, on station. There's another uh, moon base in the Canary Islands. Some of the ones uh, I don't have up here, um, <laughs> Nishir and I did research our first year, and some of these are in Marseille. They have an underwater dive analog in Spain in the mountains. They have a desert uh, robotics analog. So the Europeans have built a lot of these uh, analogs that are in natural locations. Um, and private foundations are in the game too. So the Mars Societies created this one in the desert. Um, there's one up in Canada. And so they're also sponsoring uh, these research studies. So there are a lot of these analogs. So now that we have, we've established that we have the Petri dish, what happens to teamwork under extended periods of isolation and confinement, right? And teamwork, we want to know about performance. Brian. One very quick question. I don't know the answer to that. Do you? I don't, but it's Yes, definitely. Yes, good, good point. And, and I should mention that I'm not going to talk about that today, but a lot of this research is done in naturally occurring analogs. So other extreme, Nishir, did you find the answer? 6,280 days? No, no, no. 60 to 80 days. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so the nice thing about these is they're naturalistic, and, and NASA makes a distinction between what they call ICE and ICC analogs, right? ICE is isolated, confined, and extreme, and submarine crews would be one of those. ICC is isolated, confined, um, and controlled, right? Which is where the, it has the advantage, just like in the old lab field debate, of uh, these people are not there in a, operating a submarine, which gives us good performance data, but we can get whatever data we want in the controlled scenario, right? So the Navy doesn't want to hand over mistakes that are made um, in submarine crews, but we can find mistakes um, in analog crews. Okay, so this is our tried and true model uh, where we started with team performance. So we know a couple things. After 70 or so years of doing lots of experiments with teams, manipulating different conditions, measuring them, um, we know that teams that develop cognitive systems, people know what each other knows, and they have a similar understanding of a task, can anticipate and perform better, right? They don't make as many errors. Teams that like each other <laughs> do perform better, and teams that perform better like each other. Um, we have a strong relationship there. 
Teams where members are all engaged personally in the leadership of the team, so they all take personal responsibility for the team being successful, perform better. And teams that have effective coordination processes. They can integrate their behaviors and anticipate each other's actions, perform better. So that's our basic model. And then we started laying out, well, what's good and what's bad? So essentially, isolation and confinement creates a context that exerts an effect on individuals. Right? Some of those effects are actually kind of good. Anyone who's worked on a virtual distributed team knows that it's easy to get out of alignment and not anticipate and be responsive to what the other person needs because you're not in their context. Right? Space teams don't have that problem. Um, they're exactly in each other's context. So there are some things that actually will help. Motivation, these are explorers. They're on the first mission ever to go to another planet. Right? There's plenty of intrinsic motivation for what they're trying to do. Um, on the other hand, there are some problems, right? Conflict and frustration, things like fatigue and extreme boredom. Um, do I have to do this task another time? Um, extreme sensory deprivation, right? Reports of astronauts have all talked about this, sleep deprivation, um, and extreme cognitive diversity. So this is an international endeavor. Uh, by design, there can't be any redundancy in the human. So can you imagine a harder time to make a decision than when no pe two people have the same information in their head or ways of solving problems. Um, so we started with this as a backdrop. And what I'm going to show you today are two studies that we did in these analogs, one looking at collective intelligence and the other looking at decision making. Um, both of these are sets of performance criteria. And I'll also mention that when we started doing this analog research, there was only one task um, that was in the analog that gave a team performance measure. Everything else was individual performance or team what we'll call liking. You guys like each other. Um, and so that's one of the first things uh, that we did. So the question with performance is, what, do, what does performance mean when we're talking about a team? What do teams actually do? This is an oldie but goodie framework uh, that was developed by Joe McGrath that the collective intelligence researchers use now as a way to guide their research, which says, if you want to understand what the capabilities of a team that can do it all well, these are the different functions. So first of all, they need to be able to do behavioral things, right? and they need to be able to do conceptual thinking tasks. They also need to be doing things that involve integration and things that involve resolving conflicts where the group is different. And so this leads to different kinds of tasks. Type eight uh, are performance and psychomotor tasks. This is the majority of what teams do on the International Space Station, right? When they have a collaborative task, somebody's operating an arm, somebody's putting in coordinates, somebody's setting up and reading procedures, right? It's very physical work. Um, what is not typically needed on the space station, because this is what happens on Earth, are things that require creativity, right? Remember that scene uh, from the Apollo 11 movie where um, Tom Hanks is figuring out, how, okay, so we don't have the right air filter. We need an air filter. What's actually on the ship and how can we use it for some alternative purpose, right? That's an example where the ideation and the teamwork happened on Earth and a solution went up. Um, the second is what we call intellective tasks. This is where people have different expertise. They were trying to solve a problem that requires them to piece it together like a puzzle. The third one are cognitive conflict tasks. These don't have a clear right answer, um, but they require people to negotiate and deliberate and take different perspectives of people and also different perspectives, short and long-term consequences. Uh, so we implemented a battery um, to answer this question. How effective are crews at executing, generating, choosing, and negotiating? we used what NASA calls campaign three and campaign four. Each campaign has a certain set of experiments that are being done on the crew. Um, in this case, they were going to an asteroid and landing. In campaign three, it was 30 days. In campaign four, it was 45. They had different sleep deprivation conditions. We constructed a collective intelligence battery and administered it on mission day negative one, so a day before they went in and then on around day 12, 17, 30, and 41. Um, so for our tasks, we went to the team's literature to find uh, tasks that could be administered autonomously by the crew and would yield meaningful performance metrics. So we used the alternative uses task from the creative thinking literature. We used the survival tasks um, from the team problem solving literature. So you're stranded, you have these supplies with you, how useful are you? You do it as an individual. There's an, a different score for you know, how wrong are you than you do it as a team, how wrong are you? And then we used an ethical uh, dilemma task. So we gave the team a classic philosophical problem uh, to deliberate on and come up with a 
crew endorsed uh, solution. For the execute space, we used a task that NASA had implemented, uh, which is called their MMSEV task. This requires a pair of two people. Um, one is operating a joystick, and the other one is operating a control system. And they're gathering, the, the storyline is that they're taking samples uh, from this asteroid that they're traveling to Phobos. Um, so these are our campaign three crews. Um, there were four of them. There were four people. Each one went into the analog for 30 days, um, and then they performed a series of tasks. In campaign three, uh, the crews were exposed to what we call acute sleep deprivation. So they were generally allowed to sleep eight hours a night, but then there were a couple of mission days where the sleep researchers wanted to do uh, various experiments on them, so they would be uh, kept awake for 36 hours. This is campaign four. There were also four crews. Uh, campaign four was 45 days, but the really interesting part is they never got to sleep more than five hours. So if you want to know what happens to a team uh, when you put people uh, and don't let them sleep at all, um, the good thing about only sleeping five hours, we found out, is they have loads of time to do your research. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so our team was able to put lots and lots of experiments in uh, and survey measures in that campaign. So here's their uh, execute performance. So this is that MMSEV task where they're gathering soil samples. Um, each line is a crew, right? The black line is the grand mean. This is the number of days they're isolated. Um, this is their performance on the execute task. A couple of things that you note. One is that some crews are a little bit better than others, right, at this task. But all the lines are going up, right, meaning people learn. So they do this task. Um, you know, the task is in a different place. They're gathering new samples, but they figure out how to coordinate. Most of the tasks that they do on the ISS that are team tasks have this kind of a structure. Um, and so this improves with isolation. But look what happens when we studied uh, creative thinking, right? So this is a standardized scoring of that alternative uses task. And one of the things that you see is this doesn't go up. Um, by 30 days in isolation, um, this goes down to where all the crews are performing worse um, than the overall mean on this task. Uh, the four crews that stayed in isolation for 45 days did rebound at the end. So they had what's been observed as a third quarter effect. Um, but importantly, um, we don't see the same uh, performance pattern for these teams. Um, so declines with isolation rebounded for four crews. This is the choose task. Um, and so again, we see all but one of those crews decline significantly in the mission. So this is the ability to problem solve. Okay, so the Z-score is taking all the performance of these teams on this task and then comparing it. So this is not comparison to another task, yes. Yeah. Where you see the oscillation. There yeah. The oscillation is like, right? The, 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 the yeah. It's getting worse, but after a while, it, it, you adjust to it. So when I first saw these curves, the first literature that I thought of is actually in mer intimate partner relationships. So there's a literature that's tracked in social psychology that's tracked um, marital satisfaction or relationship satisfaction over time. And they actually, they wanted findings like if you have therapy, you get better, right? Um, but actually the findings that they would have were if you stay together, it gets better no matter what you do, right? So there were lots of these curves that showed, I think it's what you're saying, right? It's this oscillating pattern of like adaptation, right? So I'm miserable, I'm going to regulate, upregulate. Okay, no, I really don't like these other people that I'm working with. I'm going to downregulate, right? So you let it, but you keep it in this, um, e this equilibrium state. So this ends, but the, I think the important thing from that observation is what you can regulate and what you can't, right? And so I'm not showing this data here, but a lot of the data that we've been collecting is on their social networks within the crew. And that's what you don't, they're not bad here, right? This is where they're bad, and, and they're not all bad. The whole crew doesn't hate each other. 
but somebody is the scapegoat, right? There's someone that's not playing nicely, they're not doing their dishes, um, they're not talking and engaging with the crew when they are, they're inconsiderate, right? I mean, every crew has, when you debrief these people, there is a story about someone, right? Nashir has these great uh, sociograms, right, where he can, he can show you the story where, uh, where they don't realize that they're creating the problem for the rest of the crew. But the point is that happens here, right? So, and it doesn't affect this performance, right? So I think, you know, one of the points that I make with these data is that just because one dimension of performance is acceptable, other dimensions that require conversations and require problem solving and putting and valuing each other's expertise, those are the ones that are likely to show the decrements. Question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So let me point something. Yeah. They didn't rebound. So they end at 30. Yeah. So we expected to. So we ran the 30 day studies, Brian, right, where we only studied it three times in mission. And we had the same question like, what would have happened if they kept going? Would it have kept going down? Would it have rebound? You know, would they upregulate? And we also had the question of what were they like before? Um, the 30 days are not upregulating. No. Maybe it didn't, right, I mean, you're getting out. So here's the other thing. Um, starting in a month, we're running this for 120 days in Russia. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about that mission where we'll have the opportunity um, for four months to be measuring them weekly on all of these dimensions of performance. Okay, so um, choose tasks. Right, we see this generally declines with days in isolation. There were only two crews um, that showed the rebound on on uh, problem solving. Mm -hmm. That's coming. Yeah, you're not letting me talk fast enough. We we medicate them. They're on descent. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, so we'll get through this, Brian, so we can show you some medication. No, no. So this is the negotiate uh, deliberation task. This is the only one where we did not see a mission clock effect, right, for any of the crews. The crews are just different. Um, the good news about this one is that uh, this is something you could measure and observe before they go into a mission, and it wouldn't be necessary to continually intervene in it, right? So crews seem to show difference in how good um, they can engage in an ethical deliberation. Um, interestingly, there were two crews out of the eight that improved, right, so that did see a, a significant change. The other thing I'll point out is the best and the worst. So we ran post hoc tests. Again, this is an exercise in super small data analysis. Um, but there's there are two that are different, um, and those are the all-female crew and the all-male crew. So I don't know if that would be predicted, but all of the rest of the crews were mixed gender, and the only two groups that were different on this dimension were those. Yes? So one, partly, so the MMSEV task is done in pairs, right? So it's not all four people. Um, but they, it is interdependent, right? So it's not just a, an aggregation of individual performance. Um, but that's a good question. So a couple things about study one. One is that it showed us there's this difference in behavioral and conceptual dimensions, right? So if we want to understand the effects of autonomy and isolation, um, we have to look at conceptual problems differently than behavioral problems. Just because they can do one dynamite doesn't mean uh, that the other. And the second thing is, what's, what, where do you have to give the medicine in selection and where can you do training, right? So the way that you structure the intervention can change depending on these dimensions of performance. Is it something that they're regulating or is it something that they're just different, right? Like people have individual differences and so do teams. Okay, so our next study was to look at decision making. And I promise, Brian, you'll have a, a, a pill here. So this one we implemented in campaign four. There were actually five crews, uh, which I'll explain in a second. These are the guys that had the um, constant sleep deprivation. So they never slept more than five hours a night. 
Um, we gave them a bunch of decision tasks and we measured things like decision accuracy, how much uh, negative information that you know that nobody else knows do you share, how much positive information that you know that no one else knows do you share. Um, and to take some inspiration for this, so we don't know what decision making looks like on the way to Mars, um, so we took some inspiration from the movies, right? So you could imagine if you're not caught up on your uh, space cinema, remember the uh, crew in the movie Interstellar where you know, they're, they've got to save humanity, the planet Earth is no longer livable, and they have three potential planets that they could go investigate. At the end, they're choosing between two, and, um, and all of humanity rests on, they only have enough fuel to get to one of them. Um, if you remember the opening scene of The Martian, the crew is on Mars, and they're deciding there's a bad dust storm coming in, are they going to abort their mission early? They only have one shot, they only have one MAV ascent vehicle that they can get from Mars back up to rendezvous with their ship. And a third one, if you've seen Alien Covenant, uh, the crew has discovered this fascinating new planet that they think is better than any of the planets that they had uh, previously thought they would encounter. The data reads on this was that it was perfect and the crew convenes and decides, are we going to change plans and go to that planet? So um, the important takeaway is that Team decisions have real consequences. Mark Watney, they abort too quickly, uh, use the one MAV, and he gets left um, on Earth. If the crew had stayed in Mars's orbit longer, right, they could have potentially devised a solution that was much better than the 14 solutions they explore in the movie. Um, if you watched Interstellar, you know that they choose the wrong planet, so now they have to, the movie has to get longer while they find a, another way to, <laughs> to defy physics. And if you watched Alien Covenant, you know that humanity's dead. There's no sequel coming. Uh, we're finished because that too good to be true planet, it was all a data manipulation from an alien species. OK, so let's put these people in those scenarios. There's a little crew right here. And this was the crew that was not. So Hurricane Harvey hit our analog in the middle. And so they had to be aborted. So we don't have complete data on them. But we have some, this, we'll call them the interrupted crew. Um, OK, so now we need tasks, right? We want very precise decision-making tasks that have this structure. Everybody's got some information that's special to them. They have to choose between different options. And they have some criteria on which they could evaluate those options. We took movie inspiration and made five of them. They're all parallel and designed exactly the way. They just have a different cover story. <laughs> So it's either gravity, there's three modules of, this, of the station, one of them's going to have to be cut off permanently. Fire in the sky, there's three near-Earth objects approaching Earth, you only have one kinetic interceptor rocket to take it out. Interstellar, you've got to choose one of three planets, you only have enough fuel to explore one. New World, where are you going to land on Mars? Your previous landing site is not going to work. And Fast Five, one of your crew members has dropped out, and you have to choose from one of three possible replacements. They all have different factors, and the point of doing this um, was to have the realism of the context, um, but also have them have different expertise. So here's an example task. So fire in the sky, your crew has detected these three um, asteroids. You have one rocket. Which one is the most dangerous um, and needs to be destroyed? Everybody gets information about all three. Some of the information that they get is what we call unique, meaning I'm the expert. I, I'm the only person who knows this. Some of the information is shared. Everybody on the crew knows this fact, right? So this is a very old paradigm in social psychology called the hidden profile paradigm. Um, and so the nice thing about it is that it reproduces an aspect of space teams, which is they don't have any redundancy. So people have unique information, and that's supposed to be a feature, right? So it gives us a good way to be calibrating are they performing, because we can see their ability to put the unique information together. So we take our four people, um, we give them some common information. So this is the fact about the asteroids or whatever the scenario is that everyone knows. We give them some partially shared, so you and one other person in the crew know it. Um, and then we give you some unique. You are the only person who has this information. Of course, we don't label it. So I get a briefing, which is the knowledge that's in my head. I don't know what's common, unique, uh, or partially shared. And we design and structure the task so that they all work this way. One of the options is the worst option, and one of the options is the best option, if you had all the information, but you don't. We structure the information so that each expert by themselves will actually prefer the worst option, right? So, um, but if you had all the information, right, so option A is the worst, 
option C in this case is the best, right? If you had everything, if you just knew it, regardless of who had the information, you would arrive at the best choice. Um, so here's the example. This is commander, flight engineer, MS1, MS2, right? So again, we just break up the information profiles. So each person can't see the truth, but the crew can see the truth, right? It's kind of an idealized team decision task that we would like our crews to be able to see. Um, when you have small data, you have to find big data somewhere. So we went to MTurk uh, to validate the tasks before we implemented them in the analog. So we put lots and lots of these iterations on MTurk to verify that first, if you only saw what the commander FE MS1 or MS2 saw, you would in fact choose the worst option, right? And so there's three options. The base rate probability would be 33. It's at least twice that. That was our criteria of getting the task to work. Then if you had full information, so these are just MTurkers who are looking at the full information regardless of who has it, and more than two thirds of the time, they're choosing the best option, right? So this establishes that we know what ground truth is. Um, so what happens when we give this to space crews? So Brian, this slide was made for you. Um, so one of the problems with this scenario is that everybody in the crew agrees on the worst option, right? So you have two things that are happening. One is that they have to overcome this threshold of actually using information that's not in their own head. And we all know when we uh, become experts at something that we really trust our information. And it's a little harder to start actually trusting information that someone else knows to be true that you don't personally know to be true. But the second problem with this design is that when everybody's in agreement, you give that information even more weight because you say, wow, three experts with totally different information all think this is the right answer. That must really be the right answer. So we wanted to see if what would happen if we changed that feature, right? So we designed another version of this task where we call it descent. And what happens is that there's at least one person in the crew whose unique information points to the best option. Someone in the crew prefers the middle option and then two people prefer the worst, right? So we take out this consensus effect that's enacting a force on the group to reach a premature convergence. And because we only had um, four crews initially was the plan, then we had the aborted mission. Um, the, con the first time they did it, we did it the normal way, which I'm calling control. And then what we did is we had either two times of doing it in the descent condition and two times of doing it the normal way, and we counterbalanced them to cancel out an order effect that could come from that. So crews one and two, one and three give us complete data on doing the control first and then inducing the descent condition, and four and five give us the reverse order. Um, so here are the results. By the way, this control is control team. So these are uh, Northwestern students. Yes. Yeah. Super question. Yeah, I'm skipping over some details. They're allowed to talk to each other. So what they do is everything has to be implemented in these analogs on Qualtrics, right? So you show them their information profile, you ask them to make an initial choice based on their information, and then rate all of the information. Then they have a conversation as a group. So the four people come together. Um, they have a discussion about it. It's video recorded. Um, and then they have to reach a crew decision, and then they go back and individually fill out surveys again. So it is a, face, a completely face-to-face, -face, not unmediated conversation that they're having. Um, good question. So Northwestern students are pretty smart. Um, they're getting it right about 23% of the time. These, these are zero history groups, right? So these are groups that are in an educational setting. They're competitive. Um, they're trying to look good in front of their peers, but they're not isolated, confined, or sleep deprived. Um, so. Para crews, uh, in general, some are doing uh, better than those students and some are doing worse. The best we saw um, was a team that three out of five of them made the right decision, right? So it's not, when we first implemented this, one of the uh, PIs on our team said, there's no way they're not going to figure this out, right? By the third time, they'll have it down, they'll figure out the process, and they'll get it right. Um, but we never saw that happen in this um, scenario. So now we looked at our, uh, the effects of our manipulation. It had no effect on choosing the right answer or not. This is just the time effect. Um, so we saw that on day 14, all these crews were 45 days. Um, they, had, they were most likely to get it right. On day 34, there were no crew ever got it right. 
Um, so again, that's if you extrapolate out 45 days, that's the bad zone, right? Uh, they need to upregulate at this point. So now we, we use these surveys to, do, to look at something interesting, which is after they do the task, leave this one up for a second, after they do the task with the team, now we give them like a knowledge test, right? So we say, we take all the information that was unique, meaning it was in somebody's head, and we say, did your crew talk about this fact, right? Like this asteroid's gonna strike Mumbai, the one that you don't think is problematic, and the other one's gonna strike this totally deserted region of Siberia. Right, like those were real facts. Um, and we'll say like, did you guys talk about this? Did this ever come up? Um, and so what that allows us to do is to construct a measure of unique information, meaning it's in one expert's head but not the others. And it's of two types. It's either information that the expert is saying, I think we need to go with asteroid A. But this fact, if it were shared, would disconfirm what I'm advocating, right? So it's do I tell you what's wrong with my opinion? or my assessment. There's also unique information that is for, in favor of something you don't prefer. So you're saying, I think it's A, but I happen to know this fact about option C, that if you knew it, it might sway you, right? So we know individuals filter, right? If I think this is the right option, I'm gonna pay a lot of attention to reasons why, and I'm gonna discount reasons why not, okay? So we wanted to see the extent to which teams would inherit that bias that individuals have in their decision process. So this is an ANOVA run on negative information sharing. So I tell you it's option A, but I happen to know in my head some reasons why A isn't the best. Do I share them with the team or not? Um, and the only thing that impacts that significantly is this dissent manipulation, right? So individuals engage in greater sharing of information of why their option is not the best if different people have different preferred options. Um, this is what that looks like. It was a little bit stronger if we did it later. Um, than it, if we did it earlier, but it had an effect either way. So what about positive information? What about the information that only you know that supports an option that's not the one you're advocating for, right? We did not find an effect of dissent, right? We found that crews differed on this, um, and it differed over mission days. But introducing dissent would get you to talk about why your option wasn't good, but it wouldn't get you to share the positives of an option you weren't uh, supporting. So this is that manipulation not working, and that's the time effect, right? So that seemed to go up um, around week two and then went down as the mission went on, right? Um, so here you can see, again, the descent is affecting the bad information sharing, but that, not the good. So these are just the percentages. So there's a 12-point gain in how much of the unique bad information gets shared by having someone in the team prefer another option. But it, just because you can get them to talk about why their option is not right, you, it's harder to get them to talk about an option that they've already taken off the table. So a couple of things we learned from this. First, we have some validated hidden profile tasks that allow us to calibrate the quality of uh, crew's decision-making over time. We see this initial descent effect, um, although it's working on negative information. So if we go back to the um, interstellar crew um, that's deciding among the two planets, They'll talk about what's bad about the planet they're saying they should go to, but they may not talk about what's good about the other planet, right? Getting the crew to change its mind is gonna require that they share both. Uh, the second is this like lesser evil effect, right? So again, it's easier to like eliminate the choice that you're considering than it is to get you to consider a choice that you've already eliminated as an individual. Those are two different processes in the team. Uh, when they're making a joint decision. And third is this end of mission effect. They all made terrible decisions at the end. Um, so, you know, back to our model, right? So what does this mean for enabling teams? Yes. Mm -hmm. That it might not have gone up. Yeah, so we um, are doing that in the 120-day mission. I think, I mean, that one... We're using these same five tasks in Russia, um, and so that one is much closer to an end of mission effect. So obviously we're curious to see that, um, but we don't have a past, you know, the last 10 days we don't have a, we don't know that it wouldn't have rebounded. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes? So defer this if you're
So I love that question. It's a little bit beyond our data. Um, but having been in, immersed in this problem for a few years, I think what's really interesting about it is a larger question about teams over time that I think the teams community has not dealt with, right? So if you take that, I've meta-analyzed like every construct that's been looked at in teams, right? So I, this is before I had a lab um, when I was an assistant professor. So I used other people's data. And one of the things um, that you find in that literature is that if it's over time, it's over time in a day or a week, right? So there's not a lot of true, you know, when we try to extrapolate out to teams, we think about teams that are intact, like a cancer tumor board that meets every two weeks and talks about really extreme cases and tries to put people's expertise together. Okay, so when you think about what does that performance over time mean, it's likely that there are pro decision and, and discussion processes that are different, right? You know in a relationship, when you've been together for a long time, you tune things out. Like my kids come in and I'm analyzing data and my daughter will yell at me, did you just hear me? I just told you a whole story, right? And I'm like, I'm really sorry, but unfortunately I have this adaptive mechanism <laughs> which I didn't even hear your voice. <laughs> Can you repeat that? I leave out the adaptive mechanism part, right? But we develop this, and, and sometimes it's good, right? But it's, it's really bad if you need to listen like it's the first time you're hearing it to everything someone else is saying. There are these diaries in Antarctica where there's one, um, where they're taught these field crews that are out in tents for extended periods in extreme cold, and they're talking about this end of mission phenomenon. And one of them says, when you get to the point where before the other person even opens their mouth, you know exactly what they're gonna say, that's the problem. Right, And they talk about it like you're relying on that person for the, that's the only variability you're gonna get. There's no color variation, no temperature variation, no sound variation, right? Just in this extreme sensory deprivation, all you have is another human being talking, right? And so you need them to say something different, but you also need to listen in a way that we don't normally do in um, a lot of long-term team relationships. So I think, again, that's beyond um, our data, but that's um, some of the things we've observed in this context. Okay, so more. I won't show data, but I'll show you a little bit about what we're doing next. So um, these are some of the countermeasures that we're looking at. So these are the next set of pills. Um, a lot of them are being developed in Sonic Lab, and I'm going to talk to you about one. So one is a crew composition pill, right? Another is manipulating a decision process, having a protocol. There's a protocol for everything else in space teams of how you fix an arm or how you operate on this. Why can't there be a protocol for how you, ha how you make a decision? Um, a shared leadership protocol and a work design intervention. Um, and so here are some scenarios with crew composition. It's fun to think about this. Um, NASA will likely never have the ability to pick an entire crew, right? So while that's algorithmically tough, the nice thing about picking the whole crew is that you can optimize on everything that you want to optimize on. An international crew presents the challenge that you're engaging in what we might think of as defensive composition. I know that the Russians have picked this person, the Germans picked this person, the French picked this one, the Indians are sending this one, and the Japanese are sending them. Which American do we put on, right? So that's an, you know, maybe the American from the astronaut corps that I choose is not the same one when I know these are the other people in the crew, right? So that's one potential countermeasure. Um, and then the one that we're doing right now, I put Brennan on there, not because he's, he's being uh, manipulated, but because he's probably not here because he's manipulating. Um, so one thing that you can do is all space mission have these critical pairs of people who have to work together a lot, right? So either because of the expertise, the job, they end up getting yoked in a whole bunch of tasks, right? So maybe you can't optimize everyone's relationships, but you can certainly manipulate through composition who these critical pairs are. Um, so here's the process. So this is why Brendan's not at the talk today. Um, so you build a crew relations agent-based model. You ground it in the literature. This is the theory, everything that might be a factor affecting crew relations that will ultimately affect performance. You parameterize it on all this data collected on all these analog crews. You then take a new crew that is literally in JSC right now. Um, they're going into the analog on February 15th. We've measured them on every uh, background variable known to psychology. And 
Then you do a virtual experiment with that crew, right? So you manipulate the schedule and you say, I'm going to create a critical pairing with these two or these two or these two or these two, which is the best. You use your model to identify what the best scenario is and the worst scenario. And then you do that, right? So here's our model. So we've divided the mission into four quarters. And we're counterbalancing this, of course. But basically, the first quarter, these are critical tasks that they have to do working with this person. We're making it so that first we're giving them the best, the, what the model says would result in the best crew relations. Then we're flipping the crew assignments in the second quarter to give them the worst possible pairing, then the best, and then the worst again. And of course, every mission, it's rotating which one uh, comes first. Uh, so this is you know, one potential countermeasure of how you can use this information uh, to improve performance. And so I'll leave you with this thought, which is, uh, it might be hard to figure out space team performance, but we haven't exactly mastered this in all uh, contexts back on Earth. Um, and so some of these factors that we talk about, like cognitive diversity of experts, cultural diversity, people working at extreme distance, um, and working with high levels of virtuality um, in the processes that they're using or their ways of interacting with each other. And so are, are there insights in building countermeasures for space crews? Uh, we hope so, that can make uh, for happier teaming back on Earth. Um, and so I will just again say thanks to the team and thanks for indulging our space exploration.